we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another one of our bonus videos for this writing workshop class on creating characters. And I am here with um, friend, associate, acquaintance, local Dallas writer. I don't know. But um, this is Alex Templador. Alex, good to meet you. Hey, thank you for having me, David. Yeah. Now, we actually met through, I think it was just a writing workshop, um, like happy hour meetup. Yeah. Probably, yeah, it's been so many yeah. long years, you know. So. It, it, it was pre-COVID, I know that. And um, as, as a local Dallas author, I've been just, I always kind of keep an eye on everyone else and kind of what they're doing. And your career has been really just amazing. Uh, in the past few years, um, you are a writer of fiction. Uh, the one that comes to my mind without having to look it up is Half Outlaw, uh, which I remember that. And then before that one, it was Secrets of, I'm going to draw a blank here. It was Secrets uh, of the Casa Cas Yes. Um, yeah. But I remember we were talking a few years ago and you had mentioned that you were pretty much like finishing up Half Outlaw. And then you had this other book that you were working on, which was a nonfiction book that I remember the deadline. I don't know if it's changed, but the deadline at the time sounded really wild. Uh, but the book yeah. is almost out. Or at the time that people watch this video, it will be out. All right, great. I don't I don't have my copy yet because it's <laughs> when we record this, it, 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 it'll be August 13th. That's the rule. Yes. Okay, great. All right, let's see, see the book again. Okay. Got to hold that up. Writing an Identity Not Your Own. And I remember even when you were talking about this book, I was thinking that this is a book that is long overdue. Thank just you. from the conversations that I have with readers and authors where, um, well, and, and I even remember, not even to jump into all that, but I even remember we were having a, um, it, it was a heated discussion. We weren't disagreeing with each other, but I remember we were both kind of worked up about it. I think, uh, was it the book American Dirt had just come out? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I came at it from not really having read the book and only knowing a little bit of it. My wife tried to read it and she mm -hmm. kind of noped out after the first chapter because it, it was really heavy for her. And she was just like, I can't handle that. But but then you were really, I was listening, you were really educating me on just how much this author had kind of missed it. Did that book at all inspire you to write this one or were those just kind of concurrent? Uh, so the book inspired me, well, actually it inspired Blake Kimsey at writing workshops to reach out to me and ask me to teach a class on the subject. And I talked, taught the class for a while, uh, not only with writing workshops, but with a bunch of different, um, other associations, writing groups, book clubs, different events and such. And when I was teaching all these classes, you know, one of the questions I get is, what can I read when I'm not in this one hour, three hour, four week class, whatever it may be, what what can I do to continue my work? And I would look up stuff and I was trying to look up books and I couldn't really find one that covered a bunch of different identities. It would cover maybe like just race. Um, and that was like one book. <laughs> um, and then the other information, a lot of it was like not being updated on websites or it was one article. And so I was just noticing there wasn't a lot of resources and I don't know what made me go to my agent and say, you know what, <laughs> I think I should write this book, but I eventually did. And, um, she was like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's go for this. And funnily enough, my book ended up getting sold, um, to St. Martin's essentials, which is an imprint of St. Martin's, which is an imprint of Macmillan, which That's is like the nice. parent company that published. <laughs> Oh, American right. dirt. Yeah. Yeah. That that that's a weird connection. I was just thinking of the Macmillan. I was like, yeah, that's one of the big ones, but I didn't even yeah, I didn't realize that they were the ones who published America cuz they put if I'm not mistaken, they put a lot of money behind the release of that book. Like that was one yeah. that they were kind of banking on to be a hit. In you know, I, I will say they were the parent parent company of whichever imprint. I can't remember uh, off the top of my head which one it was. But yeah, they put more money toward that book than most debut writers get. Uh, and, I, and I have all the figures in, in my book, um, 
but it was like marketing numbers, first run of books, uh, publicity out the wazoo, just so much stuff that was kind of wild for somebody who didn't really have any background or uh, knowledge of kind of somewhat of what she was writing. Um, so it was interesting to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to circle around to it for a bit, but I think one of the reasons why your book really struck me is when you're talking about writing a character or writing a book, I feel like this has become one of the essentials. Like there is a book, like I've got a book on being an ally, but being an ally is different than writing identities that are not your own because um, I might as a person say, okay, I am the father of an out and proud lesbian. That mm -hmm. does not mean that I have a blank check to write about the lesbian experience. Like, I don't know all that there is to know with a confidence to write about it, where yeah. I am both embracing, like, you know, it, 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 there, there's just a part of that where I feel like a book about writing other identities is not the same as being an ally to people of those identities because there's a yeah. different requirement. I would agree. And I think like, yes, I encourage people go buy nonfiction books about different communities and identities and ethnicities and orientations and et cetera. But yeah, when it comes to writing specifically, there are just so many things to think about because you're essentially creating a person of which you, experiences you don't know. And we do that as writers all the time. But I think when it comes to historically marginalized identities, we just have so much bias that we're not aware of. Even if we are allies and we're connected to people of those identities, it's it's so wild how your brain works. And I've been doing a lot of work over the years on trying to recognize my biases. And even now I've written this book, even now I'll be reading something and I'm like, whoa, like, why was why would my brain go that way when I don't believe that or like why why is this thing making me think that or how is the media affecting me so it's it's I see these things everywhere now because I wrote this book but it, it is fascinating how your mind doesn't even recognize a lot of the things that you don't want to write in your work and it just naturally kind of comes out without you trying you know or meaning to yeah, and I think, um, and this is where I circle back to American Dirt, is my experience talking with authors and particularly authors is everyone agrees, or most everyone I talk to agrees, that it's important to write with compassion and sensitivity and being aware of negative stereotypes, harmful stereotypes. But it's like every author thinks that they are the exception when it comes to writing about things that might be uh, deemed problematic. Like, yeah, I know I shouldn't yeah. be touching on this, but it's okay for me to write about it because X, Y, Z. And that's what I found with American Dirt was it felt like kind of her first wave of protests or kind of responding to it was saying, no, it's okay for me to write about it because of my own heritage, my own background, my own experience. And I, I feel like a lot of authors do that where they're like, okay, I'm a good person. I I, yeah. I I vote Democrat. Clearly, I I won't get this wrong, but that's yeah. not. It's it's more complicated than that. It is, and I think um, good people. I mean, like the the basic thing is is like good people make mistakes, and they're not even always aware that they're making mistakes. And in the book, I I talk about she probably you know she had good intentions. I know she had good intentions. That doesn't mean she didn't have biases. It didn't mean her editors, her agents, her publicity team, all of them also had bias, had no recognition of what was happening or they ignored it, whatever it may have been. Um, the people who are in publishing don't even recognize it because they're in a system of which, you know, they don't have to recognize it all the time that the, there's these um, inequities and there's these things that they're not even aware of. So it's it's just like this big systematic thing. But yeah, definitely um, it's hard to admit I can do something wrong even when I'm doing trying my hardest to do something so right. 
Um, because like, again, those biases, they are all in our heads. And we, as I think writers, we intuitively write. A lot of us, that's how we come into writing. We might not even take a class before we start writing. We're, we're just intuitively writing these stories based on kind of stuff that we read. And we don't think about, okay, well, how do I know that character? How am I, if they're going to have a different gender identity than me, really, what do I need to think about in terms of how they walk around the world and experience it and see it and are treated because of it? I, I don't think we think about those things that often. I, I mean, I didn't um, yeah. for well, a long time. Yeah. And I think about, um, um, and I don't know if you address it in your book, because once again, August 13th is when the book comes out. Everyone needs to go get it. But I remember my wife and I watching uh, The Green Book, the movie. Oh. And we, oh, yeah, we, we got out of the movie thinking it was a very great, heartwarming movie. But part of it was because there is a genre of movie about racism that sort of cater to a white audience that yes. it's like, yeah. it's it's catnip to us. And we go, oh, that was so sweet. But then later we read that the Green Book wasn't writing about these rundown hotels, but it was also, it was actually about like fine dining and hotel stays. It was about luxury and class. And we were fed sort of this misery gospel that, that yeah. <clears throat> and so it's like, oh, we were being painted this picture of suffering when really this was a story about joy that the green book was about people finding these great hotels that would serve people. And so what we were doing was reinforcing this negative bias about the suffering of black people during this time. And it comes really complicated, but it wasn't until my wife and I read about it that we then kind of replay the movie in our head and go, yeah. Oh yeah, that movie was, eh, that was not yeah, the movie. Yeah. That wasn't the movie we, we thought. And so I when you talk about people having good intentions, I don't doubt that the people making that movie were like, this is going to be a good movie about all this stuff. But you're like, you know, you're being historically inaccurate in a way that perpetuates harmful stereotypes. And yeah. there's probably, I, I guess the, the, the statement comes was this your story to tell? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm curious because I do know of an author who she has said that she will not write other identities. She doesn't explore any of that because she's afraid of getting it wrong. Yeah. Where in the book do you fall on that kind of idea of like, is, is it better to avoid or is it like, how do we, how do we, how do we tell stories that are not our own? I guess is, is I don't know. If that's a great question, but I'll throw it at yeah, you. Yeah, anyway. no, it's a good question, and okay. I and I get asked this question all the time, and I know I'll keep getting asked because it's 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 a, the, one of the biggest uh, questions at the heart of this conversation. Where I sit at it is, um, we all okay, we all write other identities, and all of us have probably written historically marginalized identity, and number one, women. We've all like written a woman, unless we're writing about a world where only men exist. And that's a specific type of writer. Um, so we've all written a historically marginalized identity. And I don't even think we think about how we create women or how we uh, showcase women in our work. We're just like, oh yeah, that's not even a thought that it's historically marginalized identity. So we're already doing it. I think what people think about when they say that word is I'm not going to write a different race. Like most of them think I'm not going to write a different race or ethnicity because that's probably the biggest charge um, identity to write about in terms of like just the conversation in, in the U S but what I have tend to find. And what's funny is I think that many of us write worlds in which other identities exist. We might not specifically write about disabilities, but if you're writing literary fiction in our reality, disabilities exist mm -hmm. and if you leave it out completely then are you showcasing really our reality if you're not even thinking about that in the world that you're building if it's our reality what kind of biases are coming in are you using even small uh, words that are ableist and you're not even aware that you're doing it and you're not even intentionally trying to write 
historically like a dis a character with a disability. Um, so I wouldn't say there is this like argument to be said that there are certain stories that I think people of that identity should have the opportunity to tell and that's for publishing to get on. They should give us the same um, financial marketing opportunities as somebody who wants to write our historically marginalized identity. And until they do, we're gonna keep having that conversation. That's really on publishing. Now for everybody else, if you don't feel comfortable writing another historically marginalized identity as your main character or secondary character, don't do it. Like, I, I totally understand that. Work on whatever you got to work on. I'm not, I don't I never want to push anyone to do something that they're not ready to do. But I want writers to think that whatever world you're writing about, you probably have other identities that are coming up in ways you don't even necessarily are conscious about or intentionally trying to include or discuss, but it comes up in your writing. So I do think that my book is helpful in at least making you think, well, I only have like tertiary characters that are a different race. Well, that still matters. You still need to make sure that certain things don't pop up. Um, you need to be aware of those things. Uh, and I think if we just say, I don't even want to look at it, I don't even want to touch it, you're going to get you're going to find that it pops up in ways and you're going to get disappointed when it, you know, somebody points it out or um, you recognize it five or 10 years later because you didn't want to think about these things. And I get it. It's scary. It's uncomfortable, but I hope people do, you know? Yeah. It's like, this is kind of the game you signed up for. Like as a writer, as a writer. You're, you're writing about a world. And, you know, the thing I always think about is uh, I am a white cisgendered male but my world is not white cisgendered male. You know, uh, I think it was Mary Robinette Kowal who said that we don't uh, we we don't subtract uh, or it's we we add homogeny for the realism. Um, yeah. I'm I'm getting the quote completely wrong, but it, it's That's realism. It, is this yeah. idea that my world is more than just people who are like me, and um, and that. You know, I write in fantasy, but yeah, I still have to decide what are kind of the the rules in the world that that we live in. And um, I actually had a um, sensitivity editor for when mm -hmm. I was world building, and yeah. one of the things that she said to me that I thought, as someone who is not a historically marginalized identity uh, in most categories. Yeah. Um, she said something to me that I thought was really profound, which is she said, you don't have to like write, um, you don't have to introduce trauma into this world. You don't have to have people reliving yeah. trauma through your book. And so you don't, you don't need to be, uh, yeah, throwing all this trauma in there. Um, yeah. You can avoid all of that and, and decide that the world that you're creating is, an aspirational one. It is It is one where there are other issues. There are dragons, there are monsters, but this issue we don't have to worry about. Um, yeah. And I, I feel like even like George R.R. R. Martin, who when talking about uh, sexual violence in his books, he says, well, I'm just being historically accurate. I'm like, dude, it's Westeros. There, you made it up. <laughs> yeah, it's not, a, it's not history. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other world I know um it's funny and I think this book might um you know I have a section with genre specifically that I speak to to genre writers because I say I think genre writers can get in their head of going I'm making something totally up and stuff from my world's not going to be in there and it, it might even be romance writer who does write about within our world and they'll go well I don't want to write about that like but somehow it still loses it its authenticity um yeah but what i tend to find is that it comes up in genre just as much as any other thing because you can't write something without a basis of the world that you live in without the knowledge that you have as much as i would love for us to like create something i mean we we do create fantastical worlds and such but a lot of it comes from what we know in our own world, from our own history, from our own experiences. 
And so if you have those biases, they're going to make their way in there. And I, I mean, I was even thinking about this with in terms of fantasy you know, or sci-fi. Fantasy and sci-fi writers can choose, you know, a lot of things when they're building a world. If you choose not to have any characters with disabilities, as a writer, you got to go, what kind of message does that send? Or if I'm writing a sci-fi where there's no queer characters, what kind of message does that send? It sends a message to the reader. I'm not saying it can be one, it's bad or good, but it does send a message. And you have to consider what kind of feedback are you going to get from your readers or how does that play a role into everything else in the book? Does it fit into stereotypes? Maybe it does of erasure, um, but it's it's all those things. Yeah. Well, and even I was noticing as I was talking to you, talk, even talking about the fact that I had a sensitivity editor is me trying to tell you that I'm one of the good ones. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not like those people, but that's the thing is, is that everyone's going to make mistakes. Everyone's yes. going to not get it right. And for as much as I want to check all the boxes and be the, uh, the good author, yeah. I also have to be well prepared for when someone comes to me and says, I really don't like the way that you portrayed this. And am yeah. I going to be defensive or am I going to listen? <laughs> and I talk about that. At, I keep saying this. I talk about that in the book um, because I really do want writers. I don't know. I, I want writers to have some protection because I know this is scary. It's scary to write your heart into a book and share it with the world and somebody say, that plot's awful or that setting doesn't make sense. Like even that, that basic stuff is hard, but to get feedback about your own biases is even more uncomfortable and awful. And I share a lot within multiple chapters of mistakes that I've made. I, I mean, I am somebody who is a woman mixed. I'm Latin. -A, I, I, and then I also, like you were talking about, I all have all these connections. I grew up in a family with a sister who, ha who has physical and intellectual disabilities and a brother who's queer. I have all these things, but it didn't prevent me from accidentally writing something that an, a beta reader wrote. Like she wrote a note, like this could come off as homophobic. And I was like, oh, shoot, <laughs> you're right. And I didn't recognize it because I have biases. Um, as much, you know, writing as I've done about the queer community and my journalism side, and I'm connected to the queer community, I'm still straight. And I just didn't see those things and stuff like that's going to continue to come up. So I say, if at the end of your writing process, you can ask yourself, what did I do to write this well? Did I go and change up my, my bookshelf? Did I read authors of that identity, support them financially and, um, on Goodreads reviews and, uh, or following them on Instagram. Did I do all the research I could do in all the ways that you can do research? And did I invest in that community so that I learn about these things that I wouldn't be able to learn about in a book or a podcast or whatever it may be? Um, but even if you do all that, you still might make a mistake and you might not recognize it. Your sensitivity editor might not recognize it. You might not recognize it for 10 more years. And it's just something that I don't think is going to go away as much as people want to hope it will. Uh, I do think it's going to make us better writers. It actually challenges you to think about character building, world building, and how, like, having that conversation with an audience in a way that you don't even think about having the conversation with an audience in terms of writing all the time. So I'm excited of where this process can maybe encourage writers to improve and change up their writing styles. Yeah. Well, and I, even I was thinking sometimes like overcorrecting what you might view as a negative bias might itself reveal a bias. I was thinking about, uh, and we could spend another hour talking about uh, Joss Whedon, uh, the person who wrote Buffy and Angel and all those. Series. Oh yeah. He was one of those people like me, who is very much a proud feminist but he yeah. used that as a shield to deflect valid criticisms against his work. And one thing in particular is this idea of the strong female character. Yeah. And the strong female character tended to project a male strength. Yeah. And it's like, well, what's wrong with some more what we might consider traditionally feminine values in a hero, why are we having to make the the female 
uh, identified character more masculine in order to be heroic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely we will probably, we all tend to find like, if we go look back at TV from five years ago, 10 years yeah. ago, whatever it may be, is that like, you know, I love Charmed, but it doesn't mean that there weren't like some problematic stuff in there. And even the actors will talk now about like, oh yeah, like we were kicking ass as like witches, but some of the stuff they made us do or wanted us to do is very like sexist or misogynistic. Um, there's a great book coming out and I love to highlight other books that will help with this writing process. It's coming out this month at the end of this month in July. It's called A Tale of Two Titties. And it highlights all the stereotypes and literary tropes about women mm -hmm. that um, we've seen most, a lot of male writers do. And she does it in a very funny, satirical kind of way. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. And, um, and you know, I don't like, um, I don't like using the word canceled, but to me, what it is, is you're disqualifying yourself because there are certain readers who are saying, oh, this writer, when he writes women, it's really cringy. And I don't read writers like that. And so you kind of get removed from the consideration list. Now, there may be author readers who really like your stuff, but I, I yeah. do think that when you get it wrong, you disqualify yourself. Yeah, I like the way that you said that. That's a good way to kind of like think about it, especially because I know there's so much resistance to people even wanting to try. Yeah. Like, it's not fun to go like, eek, maybe I've been doing things wrong or like yeah. I made mistakes. That's not fun at all. Um, but I, I mean, like recognizing your biases aside, it actually does make you a better writer. You actually like will look at a scene and go, maybe I can write something alternative. And I've, I've done this myself, which is why I'd say, I think this makes be people better writers. I'll look at a scene and be like, something doesn't feel right. Like that dialogue kind of feels a little stereotypical. I'll rewrite the whole scene. And I'm like, that's just better. That's just like, not even better because I took the stereotype out. It's better. Yes. Because I took the stereotype out, but it's also better because now I added some to, something to the scene that wasn't there before that I, I went thought I took it out and it gave me a path forward in a way that I didn't expect. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and um, I, since in this class we've been talking about Shakespeare, I, I have to bring up the Bard for a second because the Bard is kind of an interesting case study in that people praise him for his complicated and nuanced female characters while at the same time, some of the stuff that he writes is incredibly sexist. And yeah. you take something like Merchant of Venice where the character of Shylock is simultaneously humanized in ways that is really moving, but he's also one of the most, like one of the go-to examples of an anti-Semitic character um, yeah. with all the tropes. And so what you have, and, and, I, and I do think if we were to hop in a time machine, go back to Shakespeare's day, we might be horrified by the amount, I guess not even the amount, the, the type of racism and sexism that was rampant. And even, we don't even think about it as much, but even uh, religious uh, oh, prejudice. Yeah. And, and so as readers, what are we to do with someone like Shakespeare, who is simultaneously brilliant and heavily problematic? Yeah, I, well, there's many uh, writers who are known as, you know, the classics, the ones that we're all made to write and, or to read in school or encouraged by society that is like, this is the best, you should read this. Um, you know, I actually think it's kind of a practice to read some of that stuff. If you can recognize what is problematic in other people's work, you will hope, that will hopefully stick in your mind and go, I shouldn't write it that way. If you understand the ways in which um, their depiction, the portrayal, or how that stereotype played in a plot, you will take that into your own writing. So I don't think it's like we should read anything and just throw it all aside. Um, I do think we should talk about it as openly and honestly as possible. And a lot of times our schools or programs or institutions or whatever it may be, don't want you to criticize things that they've called the best of the best. 
I don't think there's any problem with it. I, I, I mean, I've been reading a ton of fantasy lately um, to kind of get into my magical realism mindset while I'm working on new books and I'm working on a fantasy book. And I mean, often there's at least one or two things in the book where I'm like, ew, cringe, you know, um, it's a great book regardless. This. It's still a good book, but there's just one line where I can see that the bias just got missed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to throw away the book because there's still other stuff it can that I can take from that story, from that type of writing. Um, but I'm glad that I recognized something that was not great. And hopefully I continue to recognize that in, in other works. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and even I think uh, Shakespeare in writing identities that are not his own, I mean, he wrote about kings and queens. Royalty yeah. is not an identity that he, like, that's an identity that's not his own. And he yeah. could put himself into the mindset of what is it like to be royal? And so I, I think, yeah, even when we move beyond gender and race, like, clearly Shakespeare was exploring these ideas, but that also does not mean that he was not a product of his time mm -hmm. and his own experience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was definitely writing about class and sometimes race, uh, gender identity. And yeah, he wasn't going to be perfect about it. We know that. But I do think, I mean, a lot of people love, they love Shakespeare. They study Shakespeare. I don't think, I think we can also recognize that there was problematic stuff in his work and still have those people who praise his work. And if anything, it makes it even more complex, tells us something more about the history um, and the social uh, structures at the time and ecosystem. But I hope that writers now are a little bit more self-aware and like we can maybe not do that in our work. I'm sure people 50 years from now will be able to recognize some of the problematic portrayals or views that we have in our mindset through our own work. But I'm hoping we change some things. <laughs> we can be a little better than Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, and I, I think you brought up, you kind of hinted at it a little bit, was talking about this idea that we almost have this pantheon of sort of established writers. Maybe part of our goal is to expand it, not to remove yes. Shakespeare, but to say, okay, what about women dramatists? What about dramatists of color? What about dramatists of different backgrounds? And, uh, you know, and, and explore those. We may not find many just because of historical, um, you know, inequities, during the 15th and 16th centuries. But mm -hmm. that does not mean, you know, my wife is an artist and the sheer amount of male artists that you see in art museums mm -hmm. is tragic because we know that there are there were women artists of that time who were creating amazing work. Yeah. And we have their art. It's not like it was lost to history. It's just not being put in the gallery. So I think maybe... Part of our job as readers is to to redo the gallery, maybe. Yeah, I think our perspective of what is what is literary or what is art um, needs to shift a little bit. Like we have that that whole um, judging the criteria was based on a very you know white male, usually even at the time maybe rich. Um, or like a specific type of uh, products. So we know there were women creating beautiful tapestries or uh, ceramics, but do we consider that to be art? Um, do we consider women's journals to be literary? Because they would have been writing journals in you know the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, you know, even rethinking what is maybe didn't need to be written down. We know oral stories from people from different communities and nations around the world. It wasn't written down at the time, but it's been in their communities for centuries. And that can be, you know, a high form of literature. I think just rethinking about the structures and what made those structures and why we say one thing is better in literature than another. If we can rethink those things, I think it'll just open up the world of of uh, possibilities for us. I know that sounds very corny, but open up like what we read and what we can interact with and like what we see as good art and exciting moving literature. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I think uh, literature at its best, in my opinion, is, mm -hmm. is, is an act of empathy that, that mm -hmm. we are learning about other identities. And, you know, I 
I, I think about some of the books I've read about different experiences that have really, I mean, we it's a little cliche, but it broadens our horizon. But it's yeah. more than that, it's it's just it, it causes me to stop and think and realize that not everything is seen through my perspective or my lens and that there's a whole other world out there. So um oh yeah. Well, um it is a little bit of a cliche that when men are on a literary panel that we tend to dominate when we're talking. So I, I before we close, I wanted to ask um, with your book, for people that are wanting to create a character, um, what are some of the things in the book that you would really want people to pay attention to or to kind of call out to say, okay, you definitely need to read this part and this part and this part to get a good start. I mean, they should read it cover to cover, but what are some parts yes. of the book that you think are really good for people who are writing characters or creating characters? Yeah, I think uh, I want to say it's chapter four is about characterization. And there's an exercise at the end there that really kind of makes you break down everything you think about in a character. So it's like it's a, a list. I kind of uh, portray it as like, say you go to the a therapist and they have you write a list of your whole history and background. But I include things like, um, fears and hobbies. So it's all these, this list about your character, but I think different parts of the book will have you go, okay, if they are this ethnicity, what are the laws that affects their ethnicity? What's the history? What's the cultural experience, the social experience? Um, what's the joys of that culture, of that community? What are the, yes, the traumas as well, but definitely more of the joys is, um, too. I have a, a chapter on discrimination. So it questions, do you need to write discrimination? Um, can you handle writing certain discriminations? What are the different discriminations that you could write about? Um, how they might present and how you can fall into certain traps. I also think um, the editing section is probably my favorite of the whole book because I'm I'm a editor. Like I I love writing, but I love editing a book because that's when my writing gets better and I that's when I craft the whole story. So it's set up in a way where you have an editing checklist, but it also encourages you to look through a very long chapter of stereotypes and tropes that I wrote for everybody that I gathered for every identity and others. Um, so it goes between race, ethnicity, sexual orientation or romantic orientation, disability, um, gender identity, class, age, religion, uh body type substance use disorders like I break down it's so many identities and I give you so much information that you don't even have to read all of that at once but if you're editing you can go you know what this character is somebody who is um asexual let me go to that section in there and I, and I will know like I can reference all of that um and then I do have a section where it breaks down different things to think about when you're specifically writing for characters of a certain identity. So if you're writing disabilities, are you using person first or identity first language? I I have a section that makes you rethink sex, gender, and gender identity. What are those words and how does it play with your character, like interact with your character? Um, I'm kind of just breaking down so many of the chapters, but I hope, um, all of those things will kind of come together. I I just want to say all of those things because I think people can get a little overwhelmed when they're reading it and take breaks as much as you can, but come back to like the next chapter because you might not think it will relate to what you're writing, but I would be surprised if it didn't come up in your writing sometime in the future, just as we as writers continue to grow. That's great, yeah. Well, Alex, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And can you hold the book up one more time? So we yes, get... I'm so glad we had this conversation. Uh, it was a blast. Now, Writing an Identity Not Your Own, a guide for creative writers. I also have a website called writinganidentitynotyourown.com. I'll put up more blogs, um, more information kind of on the subject that I wasn't able to include in the book or, you know, topics that came up after the book has been published now. So hopefully I can give more uh resources to people wonderful and of course you can get it on any of the online bookstores but you can also go to your local bookstore and just simply ask for it and they can order it 
Um, or yes. you can go to the library and ask for it and they will find a way to get that book to you. So yes. And it'll be in print, ebook, and I narrated the audiobook. So there will be an audiobook accessibility option as well. That is awesome. That is really cool. All right. Well, Alex, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I had a great conversation with you. Uh, let's see.